So Trevor Jacob, he's upset a lot of constituencies, the aviation community, the skydiving community, and those people that love condors. The one group we haven't heard from is content creators. I mean, is this a documentary or is it a story? What's true in this and what's a lie? I suspect the FAA, the NTSB, and local law enforcement would like some answers to those questions as well. So what do we know is true? I mean, he took off from the Lompoc airport on his way to Mammoth. He is flying a plane with five GoPros and a disconnected fuel tank. He's got a water bottle for a co-pilot, and he's wearing a full-size parachute as he flies the plane. He brings his friend Johnny, though I have my suspicions about that really being Johnny. He flies into the mountains. He jumps out of the plane. The plane eventually crashes into this hillside, which is a wilderness area. He eventually lands in that same wilderness area. He gets into a significant number of altercations with bushes that mostly get the better of him. He finds the plane. He recovers his GoPros. And he eventually drinks the sweet nectar of river water that has tadpoles in it. I'm suspicious that anything else in the story is true. From the NTSB report, we can see this did happen on November 24th at approximately 10 a.m., and we can see the location where it was recorded. Pulling up a map of California where you can see where Lompoc is and where you can see where Mammoth Lakes is, his supposed destination. Now, if we come in here, we can see Lompoc and where it eventually crashes a little over 30 miles north and east of town. Let's look at the path he took. So we start off here at the Lompoc Airport. We can know exactly where he took off from, and we can figure out what time by basically looking at the sun and this fridge line, calculating where the sun is, and then going into Google Earth Studio and looking at the sunrise and figuring out what time that is. And it turns out it's about 9.30 a.m., plus or minus a few minutes. This is a little bit later than I originally estimated. Using images from the video, we can actually calculate his route out into the mountains quite accurately. So he's about five miles in at 2,000 feet. He continues along up this valley, and eventually you can see these greenhouses out the right hand side. So, so far, this is incredibly consistent with the flight characteristics of the Taylor craft. He's been climbing about 400 feet a mile, and he's about 17 miles in. Here, you can see that he looks down at that little mountain lake, and then he continues on to the site of the, quote, accident. Here's some of the details about the Taylor craft. These will become important later when we figure out how long it takes that plane to crash. In the meantime, Trevor's grabbing his GoPro, and he knows it's go time. You can use the images from him skydiving to figure out that he jumped out of the plane at about 10,000 feet and was in free fall for about 23 seconds. Based on his free fall of 23 to 24 seconds, we can very accurately estimate that he's fallen 34 or 3,500 feet with an additional 800 feet to deploy his parachute. Trevor is an experienced skydiver and he's using a sport chute, so the descent rate should be between 12 and 1,500 feet per minute. I calculated 1,350 from this footage. So a huge amount can be estimated from various shots. We can figure out more or less the angle that the plane is descending, how fast it's going, how fast he's descending under parachute, and we can come up with pretty good ideas of how long it takes for the plane to hit the ground versus him to hit the ground. So the plane is pretty much at stall speed, 38 miles an hour, when he jumps out of it. Eventually, just before it impacts, it's going a little over 100. 
So his canopy is fully deployed at about 5,800 feet, and the landing zone is 2,800 feet. So he has 3,000 feet to work with, and approximately two to two and a half minutes until he needs to land. The plane, on the other hand, started out at 10,000 and crashes at just under 2,500. So it descends 7,500 feet over approximately four and a half to five miles, being the minimum distance that that death spiral could happen. This makes it really difficult to come up with any assumptions where he could have captured these shots. Images from the freefall, we can actually recreate where he fell in Google Earth. And as you can see here, the blue area is where he eventually lands, the red area is where the plane crashes, and the green area is the freefall zone. And what we can see from this is almost the entire time in freefall, he's actually flying away from the plane crash, not towards it. Now, as chaotic as this looks, he's actually over that green area the entire time. Eventually, he deploys his parachute and then spins around and he's got some choices to make. Do you fly into the mountains and go get your GoPro and your water? Or do you fly down the valley to safety back towards civilization? That's right, you're Trevor Jacobs. You're going after your water and your GoPros. Now, I don't think this is really what happened, but this is what would have to be true if it did. The red is the flight path, and that's based off of the images taken from the video. You have to move 4,500 feet horizontally and only about 800 feet elevation loss. Parachutes don't have that kind of glide ratio, plus it would take too much time. Now you can model this actually really well in Google Earth Studio using the tilt and roll on the camera. And what you can see is there's very little actual movements of location and no elevation loss. And this can be almost completely recreated via changing the tilt and rotation of the camera. Now the other question is, if he had gotten all of that, why wouldn't you have continued on and gotten the crash, which would have been easily possible from the vantage point that he had? We never actually see Trevor fly in the mountains. We only see him land in the mountains. And those shots from above, well, that's implied that he took them. But I think it's equally possible that a drone or some sort of chase vehicle actually took those shots. So there's about a two minute gap from when he's under canopy until this shot. And that same two minute gap exists in the plane shots where we see the plane up above and then we see it down below. Now, if you had three different camera angles that you could use to further your story, wouldn't you use them? And I think the answer is you don't use them because it doesn't further your story. At the point he needs to make the decision to fly into the mountains, the plane's above him, flying away from him on a trajectory that would be very, very difficult to understand. And he would need to immediately make the decision to fly along this blue path to get to the point that he could take the shots down onto the plane from above. The problem that he has here is that the elevation that he's at is insufficient to be able to get to the point where he would be above the plane. If we stretch every assumption that we've made in velocities and elevation, it's at the edge of possible that he could have gotten there and actually gotten those shots, but really almost impossible. So while we don't have the actual camera footage, we can simulate what that camera footage would have captured. So here's from the tail section, and as you run it around, a nice view up the valley, and you can actually see out to the ocean nicely. And well, we probably would have actually caught Trevor here uh, towards the end of the flight. If we come up in the underwing, well, we probably actually would have seen him deploy his parachute. And as we run around again, as we come back towards him and almost hit him, we probably would have seen him there as well. So the question is, if you had those shots, why wouldn't you use them? And instead you're intercutting these quick shots back and forth where not very much is actually happening. The other thing that's hard to wrap your mind around is if you look at the overall site. At the point that he has to make the decision to fly over to that gnarly canyon, the plane's going away from him, above him, at approximately 90 degrees. It's hard to understand how you'd make that decision. Fire extinguisher strapped to your leg and wearing a full-size parachute? Well, those could be explained away by being a paranoid, terrible pilot. But if there's other shots taken, those would be very difficult to explain and would definitely show premeditation. All the shots from the bailout until the plane crash are consistent with a time frame of approximately 10 a.m. The landing and discovery of the plane as well as the hike out don't comport with that time frame at all. So what's the evidence that he could have actually taken those quote drone shots? Well, his camera's at least facing in the right direction when he lands, and it appears that he shows up to the plane with a fire extinguisher. As you may remember, it looks like he jumped out of the plane with a fire extinguisher. So as he lands, he's got his GoPro out, but then as soon as he's up on the ridge line here, he's shooting with his phone, and that's intercut back with GoPro footage and then right back to his phone. So we can go through and look for phone versus GoPro, and as we, wait a minute, is that a Glock? I'm pretty sure that's a Glock. He's wearing a Glock on his chest. Why on earth does he have a gun? This is super bizarre. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't even know what to make of that. The more I watch this, the more bizarre it gets. Anyway, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a Glock. Well, if we look here, we can see the shadow from his cell phone that he's holding in front of him. And here we're back to his GoPro, and now he's flipped his GoPro around. And then here we can see the reflection of the lens of his camera. It looks to actually be like an iPhone 13 Pro. Um, here we have iPhone, and then we're back to his GoPro as he's approaching the plane. And then pretty much from here on out, we're back to using the iPhone. As he approaches the plane, you can see that the left wing is clearly in the sunshine versus here, it's in the shade. You can also see this giant pile of twigs where he's presumably been rooting around for a while to find his GoPro. As he comes up to inspect the wreck, you can clearly see the engine here. But as you recall, as he's walking up, the prop is clearly covering the engine. In a since deleted Instagram post, you can see the propless shaft and down at the bottom there, the prop laying on the ground. In this image, we also see the orange bag that makes a bunch of mysterious appearances in the hike out. The change in time of day, change in cameras, and the amount of work done here suggests that this is a composite of at least two and perhaps more visits to the site. After he leaves the wreck, the timeline completely comes apart. Oh, another hour's gone by. This is so freaking gnarly. Oh, ow! Ow! Pretty creepy. Not creepy, but... I feel like a mountain lion or a bear could definitely be watching me right now. So now the gun makes sense. This is where the ravine ends in a cliff. <clears throat> About another hour has gone by. I was trying to follow this riverbed. About an hour later, is crawling through these bushes like I have been for the last five hours. I see the ravine down there that I'm trying to get to. The sun's going down. I've been walking for about another 45 minutes now down the riverbed. Another hour's gone by walking down the riverbed. I'm not sure if you can hear that, but you can hear a cow. I can hear a cow. There's fish in here. Tadpoles. A car. A car. And don't get me started on the fact that he looks like he has a different level of stubble throughout all these different shots. So what do we know for sure is true? He jumped out of his plane, the plane crashed in a wilderness area. And to the other end, we could say at least there's some significant poetic license in the walkout and whether that even happened on the same day. The real question is, did he jump out of the plane and land in the wilderness area all in one take? And I think that's very difficult to know what's true or what's not. We know that there's three GoPros with two minutes of video on them that have the answer to that. And it's very suspicious that they didn't make it into this video. Now, if he really did jump out of the plane and managed to fly over and capture those shots and then land in the wilderness area all in the same take, what on earth is he doing making videos like this? He should be working for Tom Cruise or working on the next Fast and Furious movie. If that is really the case, he's deeply missed his calling. And he's totally nuts because if he really did that, the risk that he took was absolutely insane. Only time will tell what the consequence of this stunt is. So far, it hasn't turned out very well for the plane, for Johnny, or for Trevor's future of being a pitch man. The real question is what will happen with this pilot's license and will there be any consequences further beyond that. Trevor made this video to help out those in the aviation community. Now parachutes and guns do have certain use cases, but I'd suggest that a spot, a GPS, and a radio probably would have served him better in this situation. For those of you who are concerned and stuck around for the whole video, the Condor Sanctuary is about 50 miles away, so those condors are fine. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a great day. Hey, wait a minute. What the heck was that? Let me know in the comments. This is never going to end.